You're watching The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV Angela Yee, Charlamagne the God. We are The Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. This is a very special guest. I know her as Pam. <laughs> I don't know what you call her. I call her uh, Maxine. You call her Maxine. Yeah, I, call see, her I mean, I know her real name, too, but right, I'm saying. Yeah. I call her Pam yeah, from The Cosby I, Show. Yeah, you call yeah. her Maxine from Living Single. Yes. But her real name is Erica Alexander. That's Welcome. right. I name. answer to it all. And thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes, we're thank excited you. to have you. You don't thank understand you. what I had to go through on Thursday nights to see you. No. Because <laughs> I was a Jehovah Witness growing up so we used to go to the kingdom hall on thursday nights ah. so those were the days of vhs tape mm. so i had to press record at like six o'clock six thirty and make sure you got a four-hour tape so it just record everything wow. up well, to i'm impressed you know yes. i think you you get a special medal for that that's beautiful <laughs> you know it was a funny thing because it was a different time and now that everyone has things streaming to them they don't have to think about those things mm -hmm. but i never saw living single until we stopped taping. Really? Wow. really? No. Why? Because we worked. We we, we filmed on Thursday nights. Mm -hmm. mm. That was our filming night. We did two shows that day. And there was no DVR then, right? No. Mm -mm. So we'd either wait for them to, you know, to come on. But the truth is, we we, we rarely saw ourselves. You could have so been to Charlamagne's house yourself, and seen though. it. You know, it's a good... It's, here's the thing. We didn't. Okay. You know, the, the critique is your your audience. Either they laughed or they didn't. Gotcha. And you sort of had the good feeling of it, and they would tell you where you're at. And frankly, for a sitcom, you need the audience to tell you. It's a back and forth, and they are the fourth character in a sitcom. How wow. many people told you, how many women were like, I became a lawyer because of you? You you know what? More than I am I feel I deserve. I mean, Marilyn Mosby, who's up in Baltimore, mm. uh, she said it. Uh, Mayor de Blasio and his wife, Charlene McRae, really? told him how, yeah, how important it was to them. You know, you meet people and, and uh, they say hello, and then they tell you something special like that. And then you realize that representation matters. It does. Mm -hmm. And there I was, and I hadn't gone to college. I still haven't. Mm. And I was being a lawyer, but uh, just, you know, graduated high school and kept working because my father passed. And, you know, I just wanted to help my mother. And here I was helping people go to college and become lawyers. That's why we need more shows like that on TV. I know we have Blackish, but the reason I went to Hampton is because of Hillman. Like, it yeah, made it, me want to go to college. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, and you know, and I watched uh, Hillman and Whitley and all of them and wanted to go to college. Well, uh -huh. And I was in there. But you know what? Things don't always work out that way. Right. And I was glad that I could help my family. But mm -hmm. uh, there you go. Well, what nice. happened, though? Because around that time, black characters on primetime were so positive. Maxine was a lawyer. Different World had the kids. Yes. Cosby Show was a doctor and a lawyer. But then it was just like, oh, let's flip the switch and show some negative representation. What happened? Well, you know, uh, I don't know exactly what happened. I think racism happens. There's mm. an institutional, structured racism and bias and prejudice in people's minds. And I think even after the huge success of Cosby Show, uh, Two different two seven world. different worlds. Single Martin. Um, yeah, um, Will Smith's show. There was no reason for them to di to digress or go and divert themselves to that. But that's exactly what happened. And mm -hmm. you can only say that you know it's you know showbiz is monitored by real people. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, that's not only did that happen, they segregated television. In fact, they got rid of mostly black cast shows from two thousand till until like Shonda Rhimes started to show wow. up. There was you know I want I, I don't want to discount Bernie. Uh, Bernie, Bernie, Mac Bernie Mac show, and mm -hmm. then there was uh, 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 Chris Rock's. Everybody Chris loves Rocks, Chris. Everybody hates, everybody yeah, loves Chris. Chris yep. But for the most part, just nothing. And it was a really hard time. And then suddenly, the the bottom dropped out of the market, and people who weren't doing well were doing worse and losing their homes. And that happened to all of us. And it was unfortunate. And then things started to turn. But it needed Shonda Rhimes to do Grey's Anatomy and have power, and then to bring Kerry Washington and Viola Davis you know, a different type of black lead. Now, you said Lou's Homes. Was it that bad? Like, was... Yeah. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. It was that bad for me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, you I did better than most. Well, it was not that I, I would work and do guest spots, and people would always often say, you know, we don't see you as much. And I say, you don't see me as much because there are very few parts. Mm -hmm. And the parts that we get, they're not paying as much. They're paying so-called top of show. They got this whole line that they would say, oh, you can get, can't get more than top of show. And if you were... The more successful the show was, the less you would get paid. What? Yeah, that's the less crazy. it mattered. That's not yeah. like that's not like a black person. Yeah, I don't understand how that works. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Jeez. Yeah. No, it was unfortunate, and it's actually uh, still in place. Did you hate reality show at that time? Because reality shows were taking everything at one time. I don't know. NBA, you know, I think I, I did. I mean, not not because they were just taking the place. I just thought it was a poor representation of what black women were being able to 
to do. And right. frankly, if you didn't mm-hmm. fit in that mold, there was nothing you could do. I mean, you sort of watched it. And you kind of, I mean, look, it was like watching a train wreck. And I enjoyed it mm-hmm. in that way because I, I actually didn't think it was real at first. It took me a long time to sort of get that, no, this is real and yet it's not real. It's supposed <laughs> right, to be right, 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 right. Yeah, It's scripted reality. Why is it's Flavor Flav on my TV? <laughs> I, yeah. yeah. You remember that? Yes. Yes. Fascinating. <laughs> I mean, you know, but that's a whole time. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, it's a whole time and you, we go back and we mm-hmm. see the, you know, you see the beginning and the fringes of this thing that's sort of encroaching and you have no idea its impact on the community, what it means for you, what it means for how people see you or mm-hmm. perceive you, but then suddenly you're an auditions and there's the person that you see right opposite you for the same part you thought well are we the same type of person they should have the right to go for those parts but maybe they really don't know what I do Mm -hmm. if I'm in the same room with them right I really believe you when you say that uh, it's systemic though because you think about all the positive images we had on television the ratings were there the revenue was coming in there was no reason to change it other than black people was getting smart right people were being influenced like you said you wanted to go to college other people wanted to be lawyers that's the only reason Mm -hmm. yes I mean, you know, I, I don't, I don't would, no, there's no other explanation for it. Mm-hmm. And that just shows you how deep and dark racism is. Mm-hmm. And it's in our minds. And then there's a lot of, you know, we have to take some of the blame, too. Mm-hmm. A lot of those images, we, we weren't force-fed. We also, you know, wrote. And um, when you got in those rooms, they often would only uh, support the ones that played to the pathology or, mm-hmm. you know, this, the cartoonish version of us. Anything that was deeper, that, that maybe, say, a Steve McQueen or somebody else might uh, pitch was immediately seen as being, you know, false. No, nobody would ever watch that. And, you know, forced us to do comic books mm-hmm. to try to, you know, do proof of, of, of uh, an idea, mm-hmm. you know, and go in at a very low margin and uh, just to try to talk about something in that would be more than in our heads. Mm. Now, you did come in here bearing gifts for us. I did, I did, I did. <laughs> Concrete Park was uh, one of those ideas. At the time, um, my brother and my writing partner, who was my husband then, Tony Perrier, uh, had an idea called Concrete Park. And we went around talking about it. And we met this studio executive who, in the middle of our pitch, stopped us and said, stop it right there. He said, black people don't like science fiction because they don't see themselves in the future. We looked at him and we're like, what? I don't and, tell me what black people like. I know, can you imagine? <laughs> because, right. You know, and, 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 and he went on and told this whole story about it. But, you know, for whatever reason, that was his thing. And Tony stopped him and he said, well, let me tell you something. For black people, the past is painful, the present precarious, but the future is free. Ooh. We mm. always create the future. That's why you have rock and roll and mm-hmm. the blues and jazz. He says, we're the aliens that you took from across the ocean to rock your world and make your t- planets twirl. And by the way, there's Samuel Delaney and there's Octavia Butler. And uh, the number one star, um, science fiction star in the world was Will Smith. Mm. He clearly didn't know what he was talking right, about. Clearly. But that's at the head of a studio mm. to tell us that. Two, two black people who we thought knew better. And, uh, was that Josh Whedon? We again. Oh, no. <laughs> that wasn't him? No, that oh, okay, wasn't okay. him that said right. that. In fact, Josh Whedon and Sue called me yeah. to do Giles, got you, got which you, is a you. Buffy uh, spinoff. Okay. No, he's he's one of the good guys. He's one of the Avengers. Got you. You know, but... <laughs> <laughs> Uh-huh. Start no, calling white allies no, no, no. But whoever <laughs> said that, you know, I'm going to dedicate a book to him one day. Oh, and, and But I'm saying it forced me to create a new skill set. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's good. I mean, you get tired um, in this business. I've been doing this since I was 14. You find different ways to recreate yourself mm-hmm. and be able to have a conversation that's beyond any one character or show. And you can't do it if you don't have the opportunities or, more importantly, if they're um, – they, they just don't exist. So we did the comic book mm-hmm. again to just show people this is what it'll look like. And then we came out in 2013. It was one of the best American comics. And Forbes right. said it was one of the best graphic novels mm-hmm. in America. And we're still out there doing it. And now the world has changed. Are people With Black still Panther buy- and all I know he's in the comics crazy, but are people still in the comics? Cause I, my kids have never picked up a comic. I was in the comics as a kid, but I don't see the kids doing no. comics. Everything's online. No, they don't. You're exactly right. Mm-hmm. And it's a, it's a shame because it was a not only a way to stimulate their own imagination and show right. them things that they may not see, uh, but also, you know, it taught them reading. It taught them how to do Absolutely. narrative work, mm-hmm. um, continuing stories, how to do cliffhangers. There were really Im- amazing moral mm-hmm. uh, um, stories tucked into there. I mean, Jack King Kirby 
and uh, Stan Lee were amazing at it. Mm -hmm. But they were just the tip of the iceberg in terms of how much talent was out there doing that. To this day, if you go to a Comic-Con, you go to Artist Alley, full of black, brown, Asian women, men doing their thing, and tucked in there are all sorts of gems. Yeah. And they do it for the love of it, not because they're selling a lot of money right. or getting, you don't, no one does that to get rich, but you do that to create IP. And that's why we did it. I'm trying to get my daughter into it because they have, uh, you know, the new Iron Man is Ironheart. And it's a young black girl from Chicago named Riri Williams. Wow. Yeah. But she ain't feeling it. She waiting for the movie. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she ain't feeling it. Yeah, no, no, we know that. But that's, we've got to start getting our young people to read. They've got to. I think their lives depend on it. Oh, absolutely. Because if they're just told what to think as opposed to reading the thing, they should go and read about Karl Marx and, um, you know, Nietzsche and all these other people mm -hmm. and read the words of Martin Luther King and not just hear their voices. Really take it in for themselves without having some other voice in their head telling them or emphasizing because then suddenly you start to find out who you are. Right. They left blueprints for us, right. but it's in a book. Yeah, my father used to say, anything you want to hide from a black person, you put it in a book. <laughs> well, yeah, I think that was, was right. a very popular phrase. Yeah. He was right. And you know what? I like to read actual physical books. I know a lot of people download their books, but it's so I can't do that. Like, I need to have the book. It's like a piece of art to me also. Yeah, and I actually think that it also connects you with the intention of, of the person. In fact, they say if you burn a book in uh, the, the fire, it burns hotter than, mm -hmm. like, wood. Really? Because yeah, because of the energy that's in it, mm. you know, the, mm. the, the the not just the ink, but the pressing, the, all that. And I think of it, you know, I'm not overly spiritual or religious, but I think that there's energy in it when you touch a book. Mm -hmm. You know, you're touching that person's intention. You're feeling what they, you know, just to cover everything that's been put on the page, way it lays out. You see what they they wanted, and again, they're talking to you. I that's totally agree with that because that's how I buy books. Like if I'm in the airport. I just be drawn to certain books. I may not know the author. I just look. I go, oh, that looks interesting. Yeah. And the same thing. I'm in the bookstore and everything. Isn't that funny? Yeah. The airport is actually a great place to yeah. suddenly turn off and have your own thoughts. Mm -hmm. But we need more of that because mm -hmm. I think we lose ourselves in sort of just having to digest everyone's, uh, you know, conversations. And I think that we need to have inner conversations, yes, alone, but also with each other. And I think that's how we do it. And this is a black woman vampire. No, right, right there. No, that's Giles. Giles. That's Giles. Giles, Giles is a spinoff yes. from Buffy the okay. Vampire so Slayer. So Buffy the Vampire Slayer, that was a very famous uh, series. Mm -hmm. And they, they, he always did the uh, continuing uh, series on comic book mm -hmm. in Dark Horse. And so uh, he called me and said, you know, I want to do a spinoff of the Giles character. Giles is the Buffy watcher. So if you watch the show, he's the Englishman who comes and tells her, you're not only Buffy the Vampire Slayer, you're famous, and I'm going to mm -hmm. teach you how to be a slayer. So he's called a watcher. Well, somehow in the comic books, he has come back in his boyhood self. And uh, so he goes to a city high school, and now mm -hmm. he meets a black girl vampire who's over 200 years old. Mm -hmm. She's about to learn, he's about to learn something about monster hunting or what it is to be human from her. Mm. Because, uh, you know, when in her day, uh, she, he's like, I, she's like, why are you hunting me? The humans. Yeah, the humans are the monsters. The humans are the monsters. I read you say that and I was like, that's dope. It's like she true. didn't trust the humans. Mm. Yeah, well, she, and, she, and she wouldn't. And she carries this real load and burden and heaviness on her heart because she's angry and she has that rage. But she's also lived a long time. So she's lived past it. And yet she says there ain't, still ain't no place for a black girl to be. She's hiding. She's in mm. hiding. And that I think a lot of women can and yeah. deal with that wears it's not easy Where, yeah. what it's you a, do all that time yeah it's just an ill metaphor for like this prejudice period because people be having this like fear of, of things that they don't understand that vampire probably not even thinking about them no exactly mm -hmm. I mean you know vampire is another metaphor for I mean sucking blood life that mm -hmm. life after death living death mm -hmm. all those metaphors are tuck, tucked up in there if you look at the Mahabharata which is 15 times longer than the Bible and you look at the Bible which mm -hmm. takes a lot of its pieces from something like the Mahabharata talks a lot about um, resurrection death living death even Jesus came back those types of things the vampire story is very interesting because it's seen as a very um, alienated person who's just there watching and waiting to suck your blood. Right. But they're also there, there as, as a teaching metaphor of life and what it is to live and how we don't live. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's interesting. Mm. Your, fa your father was a preacher, right? He was. My father was a Lutheran preacher. Um, uh, he started off Church of God in Christ. Both my parents were orphans. I was born in the mountains of Arizona. I was born in actually Winslow and raised in Flagstaff. Mm -hmm. And I lived the first 11 years of my life in a hotel called Starlight off of Route 66. 
Wow. Yes. And so uh, my father had his first heart attack at 35. Mm. So, uh, you know, if you're with a father who is a pastor, you're basically taking tipped wages. They passed an offering plate around, and then that's what you get. But he was an evangelist. That means he had, he was itinerant. He had no church. So not only would he take a tip, he took what the pastor took after he took, you know, his money Mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever, um, wages from it. Very hard way to make a living for Mm -hmm. a person who had six kids. Mm -hmm. So eventually he changed from the Church of God in Christ, Pentecostal, to Lutheran Mm -hmm. because uh, he had six kids and they had health care. And they sent him to the Lutheran Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. And uh, that was good luck for me. It was the first time we were ever in a city that had more black people than, you know, just a few that were in Flagstaff. Um, And I got to go to a summer program. My mother would take one of us each year and say, it's your turn to go to an extracurricular activity. And it was my turn. She noticed that in fourth grade, I'd done a play. And she said, you might like this. So she sent me to the Freedom Theater, which is on Broad Street. You did a little time in Philly. Mm -hmm. And um, a movie came to town. The fifth week in the six-week program came to town, and they needed little girls, and they told us, you're all going to audition whether you want to or not. It's just going to be good for you if you never do anything. I got there at 5.30 in the morning. I was second place in, second place in line, and after eight um, auditions and four screen tests, they chose me. Wow. This was in fourth grade? No. Oh. In fourth grade, she noticed that I did okay. a play, wow. but it took all this time. There I was in ninth grade, okay. and so when I was 14, 15, I got a chance to be in a movie. My little girl, Merchant Ivory, was you know, the Miramax of its day. In fact, James Ivory just won an Oscar Mm -hmm. um, for, I think, best uh, um, adapted screenplay. Mm -hmm. So he's still around. But if you were Helena Bonham Carter, they did, or Daniel Day-Lewis, they worked for uh, someplace like... uh, You think you would have auditioned if it wasn't mandatory? Yes, I would have. Because, you know, um, you know, I was, I grew up, you know, everybody has their version of poor. We were pretty poor. I mean, so we were used to dumpster diving and going and diving into incinerators for cans and digging through couches for money and doing jobs or whatever I could. Um, I would have done anything to, you know, maybe get another experience. And also, you know, I I didn't know that I'd get the part, but I just didn't want to give up the opportunity to say that I'd done it and come in and Mm -hmm. be all happy about it and see what happened. So, you know, this is another when did you, 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 when did you book both, the Cosby oh. Show? When did you book the Cosby Show? I age? booked the Cosby Show, so that would have been just in between ninth and tenth grade. Wow! And um, ex- just after twelfth grade, I went around the world with the Royal Shakespeare Theater mm-hmm. and did the movie in Paris. Came back, did a play at the Public Theater with Joseph Papp and uh, Gloria Foster. It was his last play before he passed. And Camille Cosby saw me in that play mm. and kept uh, the story goes kept telling uh, Bill Cosby to come see not only Gloria Foster, and she was the woman in The Matrix who says, have a cookie, you'll feel right as rain, mm-hmm. light-skinned woman. Uh, she said, you have to see um, um, Gloria and this little girl. And I was the girl she was talking about. Wow. I had already auditioned several times for The Cosby Show, you should know that, and um, never got a role. Because, you know, I was right in that great age group where I could have been Malcolm's girlfriend or uh, Tempest girlfriend or Lisa Bonet's friend, but never they, had they found a place. They kept saying, "Oh, we'll find a place for you." And by the way, back in the day, that was the only game in town. You know, you, there was no other place for a young person to be or audition. Mm-hmm. So, a young um, black person, yeah, 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 yeah. Black or person. any b- black really, but young black mm-hmm. person. There were really no shows. Maybe Roseanne had a few things that going on, but uh, I got a call. Could you be at his house in? Um, uh, two hours, and I showed up. The casting director was there, and he told me he'd created a role for me. Wow. And it was wow. called Cousin Pam. I remember when you first got on Cosby Show back in the day, it was like you bought that hip-hop edge to the show, and I was wondering, was that, was that planned, or was that just you? Because at the time, hip-hop was on the rise, so I didn't know if Cosby was trying to inject some hip-hop flavor he into the show. He might have, but I think what happened, it's funny that they would choose me from Arizona to, to be hip-hop. And I think, <laughs> you know, they just saw the dark skin, and, you know, mm-hmm. you, you say, oh, that person will give us the other side of the tracks. The, the show was getting a lot of criticism for being unrelatable. And so I think he wanted to bring in another character who wasn't uh, a high middle class wage kid mm-hmm. who would show, you know, what it was like to live on the other side. He chose me. I'm kind of a very um, tame version of that. Mm-hmm. I, I, there was no way on the show you would come in and be doing all that. Yeah, that wasn't his vibe. So, But it you seemed know. natural, though. Like it seemed edgy for Cosby. Like it was it like did. when I saw it, I was like, oh, yeah, she one of us. 
I'm glad you, know? you say that. You and your friend. <laughs> okay, what was I it? thought it was a bit unnatural, but and I was playing the part. What was your best friend on the show? She was in Lean Charmaine. On Me. Charmaine. Charmaine. There you go. Yeah, that was Lean On Me, Charmaine, right. Karen Melina White. And, we, and you know what? And thank God they brought them, not only that, Al Payne. Mm -hmm. Because uh, Al Payne really, they gave, um, I don't really know if the writers knew what to do with Cousin Pam. And I think it was kind of sort of given to them like, okay, now go. And so when they gave me a posse to be with, it gave me a storyline. Gotcha. Because I sort of just would float around and be, hey, Cousin Claire, how are you doing? Can I set the table? You know, come on, not real. <laughs> so they gave me them, and then we had something to do. Now, with you know, everything going around with Cosby, did you see any of that? Because I was just thinking about when we were talking, we were talking about blackish in the high school. Cosby, even as a, a, a father now, I do a lot of the stuff Cosby does back then. Like, I remember having my, my daughter on my leg, and I'm shaking her back and forth because I remember that from the show. Mm -hmm. even <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, even, yeah, I remember what you were talking about. Even the acting stuff that he did, baby. I make my kids do acting things because he kind of raised me as a second dad. And you do yes. Zerberts, maybe? I do Zerberts and all that. <laughs> yes, that's yes. true. So did you see any of that? Nothing wrong with doing anything his character did. <laughs> his, <laughs> char his character <laughs> did. He's Cliff yes. Huxtable. Okay? That's true. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, for me it would have been James Evans mm. of Good Times because he was most like my father was hard. He would whoop you. You know, I was afraid of my father that type of thing. Bill Cosby was like the best version of what a black, black dad could be. He would right. talk to you. He would actually say what was going through your mind. And I don't know, a lot of, growing up, a lot of children didn't get talked to. They weren't seen as individuals right. with a, 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 a autonomy. So he gave people autonomy psychologically that was freeing for the black community to sort of say there's a different way to relate to children. And yes, I saw that, and I was very much influenced by it. Did, Did you, you see, see this the sinister energy that Lisa yeah, Bonet said? You you know, unfortunately, I see, you know, he wasn't who we all thought he was, and it was mm. disappointing. And it's not only regretful, it's, it's painful. Um, I think I saw things that I thought were cruel at the time, mm. but I had also been raised in a cruel world. Mm. You know, I, I really had been. So you could, you kind of talk yourself into things and say, well, you know, that's how adults are. You know, and at the time I was 19, playing 15, um, you kind of take it. You kind of know in your heart that that's much more than you would you would want to see. Did he try something person. with you? No, oh. thank God. You know, I don't have a me too moment. Both my mother and my sister were great in life. Mm -hmm. So I take it very seriously. Right. Uh, allegations like that, mm -hmm. but not me. I'm very Thank happy. God. Can you give us an example of what you considered cruel from Bill Well, Cameron? you know, I think when you're the biggest star in the world, and in the world, let's be clear, mm -hmm. and he's not just creating television, he's creating must-see TV. After a while, things like a thing, you get heady, it goes to your head, you forget yourself. When I say you forget yourself, you forget that you have, you're representing not only you know, the show and that, but you're representing, you know, who people think you are. Right. Mm. So when you go in, I don't expect the person to be goody goody, but you do expect them to have some, you know, decorum and mm -hmm. some, you know, class about things. And sometimes it's just violating. You go, I, I just didn't expect that. And like I said, it probably would have been no more than what other people might have seen, you know, going to church and then you you know, the woman that you admire in church, you know, gets nasty and you go, What is that? Right. But um Why well, Sister Jenkins twerking talk to people, the way you dismiss <laughs> people, the way you you know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's it's it, it's it's like it's like that. Well I always say the true test of a person's character is how they treat people who can't do nothing for them. Right. There you go. There's yeah. power. You know, responsibility to power is how you treat people when no one's looking, when it's in the dark. And it's not that you know, again, I think people who are in the limelight have a special burden. Mm. And often people will give you a pass and say they can't always be. You know, you have you have the right to be human. You don't have to be a role model. No, right. and you more, more than that, you don't have to sit there and make everybody feel good. You can sit there and just say, I just want to be. Do you mind? Thank you, and be by yourself. It's hard to get that space, and sometimes you get a little testy. That's important, but then again, you know, it's part of the burden of what you have, and right. it's and and n no one can really understand it that's not going through with With great power comes great responsibility. Thank you, love. I was trying to get that, but my mind didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, there you go. And I think that's when you look at Dave Chappelle and people who had that, you know, thing happen and they sort of say, hey, look, I got to go away. That's what they're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Now, both your parents were orphans. How did, how did they meet? Uh, well, you know, as orphans do in church. Okay. Um, you know, they're both their godfather, or I should say, like their godfather, was the... Uh, evangelist in town. He was the bishop. His name is Bishop W.C. Griffin. And he became the bishop of that northwest half of America. Bishop Blake in uh, uh, L.A. took over for him. 
I mean, in a way, I'm from church royalty, if you look at it that way. I mean, he was a really heavy dude, but then they were just in the dust uh, bowl of New Mexico, and it was a very Southern Gothic existence. My mother, my grandmother was a witch. Uh, she Ooh. died in witchcraft. Mm. Uh, my father um, started to preach and was ordained since he was six years of age. Uh, they said he was a special child that he literally would sit on a porch and people would come up and before he could even walk, he would stand up, do scripture, and then go back to playing. Wow. My father, who was prone to exaggeration and, as to say, straight up lying, would say some of these stories, but my mother, who was not, said, no, Erica, it was very true. true. Wow. And they went around in a car and they would go on reservations or wherever they were called, live in people's garages, and he was a healer. They would bring him in, and what would happen, there would be a few people in the audience at first, they would pitch a tent, and then he would pray, do something, and then everybody would heal. Everybody would hear about a person who was healed, who they knew their whole life had some ailment or mm. sickness. Wow. And then the next night, there would be tons of people overflowing, Indian, Mexican, uh, white, black, to see this young healer. That was my dad. And that's crazy because your this dad got, got, a, got <laughs> sick at early, 35. Right. Wow. He got sick Nobody could heal him? You know, it's funny. He, he died. He, they gave him a church in East New York. Um, mm. And uh, he, before he died, I made some peace with him because he wasn't the kindest person. And uh, he said he wished that, um, that God had healed him, and he always wondered why. Sorry. And I wondered, too. I always... Um, Thank you. You said so much that I wanted that. Like, first of all, your aunt, so your much. aunt being a witch... Yeah, <laughs> my 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 uh, grandmother. Grandmother, grandmother yeah, his, his mother was a witch. And she you would said go she down died and get from witchcraft. Well, she would go. Listen, she had a restaurant. You know, black people we do so many things, catering and all that. So back in the day, you really didn't have a life job. You would do things, and she had a um, a little cafe. You know, a hole in the wall, mm -hmm. and she would put dust over the door so when people came in the bell would ring would, and dust would, would fall, fall on it. <laughs> oh no. Yes, yeah, so they called it goofa dust. Well right across the street was her competitor and they would have goofa dust too. So she would go back and forth to down deep south, south like, you know, South New Orleans, Carolina, all that. Yeah, New Orleans, deep yeah, where yeah. you're from, you know, and go get stronger and stronger um formula. Goofa dust. Mm -hmm. Well one time she came back and she by the way she would just leave my father so he'd just be on the streets. One time she came back and a uh, Mexican family took him in, and he didn't even remember English. And they uh, they begged her to let him stay. Let Roberto stay, please, Roberto. They called him Roberto. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he, they, she took him. Um, but uh, she came back, and they said she was all twisted up with her head in between her legs, barking like a dog. Wow. Ooh, and that voodoo, that root, boy, I'm that, telling you. Yeah. Have you coughing up frogs? And they said that the women in the church went to go get my eventual godfather, which was William Griffith. And he came, saw it. He left three days. He went and uh, they, they, they uh, fast and they pray. And then they come back and then they laid hands on her and they got her through it. And they, she, this is the story now. Wow. So I'm just telling you what they got her through it. And when he, she, came, he, she came out of it, he says, daughter, the Lord told me to tell you that if you go back, uh, you'll, 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 come back, you'll come back in a box. No, no, Rev. I promise I gave this up. I'm not going to give it to you. He said, I'm just telling you what the Lord told, told me to tell you. And that my father's last memory of his mother is him, is her getting in a car, a red Cadillac, because her boyfriend's name was Red, and he would just drive through, take her away. And him begging her, please, Mom, don't go, don't go. Don't worry, Robert, I'll be back. And two weeks later, they brought her home in a box. Damn it, man. So have you ever wanted to put a little dust on somebody? Like when, when friends stole the idea for <laughs> living single, did you want to throw any dust on them? No, yeah, that would be nice. I wish I had some <laughs> dust. I put a lot of dust on people. That man, is yes, crazy. you know put a little over the White House door. Uh, you know, I don't know. The White you House know. door. <laughs> <laughs> Just slip by, everybody. I, by the way, when he made them comments about Haiti being a shithole country, I was like, somebody gonna catch him. You, I heard you see that. <laughs> somebody That's gonna hysterical. get him. Somebody. No, you're right. I didn't think about it till you said they it. They didn't get close to him yet. That's yeah. all. Yeah, he well, ain't you walking know, it's the right probably store. already happening. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You know, that's, right. that's in the coming. He made that happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. They just probably, you know, speed bump, you know, yeah. forcing it through like fuel. Now, was now, your family very supportive of your acting and writing? You know, I think that they meant to be. Not all all the time. I think when it happens to you, sometimes you don't know that people resent or or see you as a threat. And it's really about their own insecurities. But when you're young, you just keep trying to please them. Buy things, make things happen, mm -hmm. say, hey, look, it could happen for you. And they resent it. I'm number four. 
So that would maybe be harder for my older sisters and brothers to see. They regarded me as being younger, not only in you know age, but also like in turn. Why is it happening to you? Uh, I think ultimately my my uh, my siblings love me, but it was very difficult for me for a long time. Why did you? Uh, Hold on one second, Erica. Uh, I gotta say, I love you. I gotta go. To, my daughter has International Day. I gotta get out of here. Oh, you you, you oh, announcing you're leaving this time? <laughs> <laughs> I, do it, I do it with friends to the room. Okay, oh, gotcha. All right, you. all right. It's okay. a pleasure. Thank you. It's, it's, it's my pleasure. You just stormed thank you so much. Nah, <laughs> <laughs> you will always be my Pam. No, yeah, thank you, love. I, I I love it. We need you out of here first to get the dust off the door. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> there'll be some. Now dust. scan the envy's empty chair. Scan the envy's empty chair. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, your father. Your father. You mm-hmm. said he was a. Uh, you said he was a preacher, but you said he was damaged and he was a hypocrite. Yeah. Um. Poop. Poverty is its own. Um, Sometimes it's it's it's. It, they say it can give you metal, like it can give you strength, but it can also weaken you because it's not the love of things. It's because you don't have anything, mm-hmm. mm. and so you start to manipulate people based on what you think they can give you. Mm. Now imagine an orphan being left on the street and just to be left with anybody, and right. his grandmother, who would take him in sometime, would beat him too. Both of my parents were abused. My mother was eventually adopted, but her mother was extremely abused. She was molested by an itinerant worker while she was there in her home. My father was just sort of used himself as this prodigy child because he could speak. He had great oratorical skills. He had the so-called power or the presence or the gift of healing um, and discernment. Then the person grows up and realizes that every time he does something, people give him $10. Mm. So how can I get that ten dollars? And how can I get so that becomes his his point of view? And after a while, that can corrupt anybody. The lack of money. Talk about the love of money, but the lack of money is just as corrupt and is dangerous and disruptive. So that's what happened to my father. I try to see him through that lens because we come from slavery, and we have to always try to say that we are our parents' best version of what they could give us. But if they had very little to give us, and if I have more now, it's because that he took the hit for that. And just getting us to Philadelphia was more, to be in a place where we could be educated and hear that people said black people are beautiful and to learn about people like Frederick Douglass and all those things. But then there was no internet. Mm -hmm. It was just God. And how can you eat? Mm. So yes, he was a hypocrite in in a very big way. And the thing that taught him to be one was religion. So you think he was uh, basically abusing his power, basically? A huge abuse of power. Mm -hmm. I think the first person, place you experience abuse of power are with your parents, certainly with women, often with your parents, husbands, uh, fathers, things like that, and that happens. How do you feel about church and religion now, growing up how, with your father and the experiences you had? I see it as a tool mm-hmm. to cl- sometimes clear your mind and get therapy to people who need it. And when I say therapy to people who need it, it was given to the slaves as, you know, to keep us calm, right. and, uh, to keep us in line, and you guys know that well. But it also gave us a place to go to cry, to scream, to to say, you know, this is hurting and maybe in the by and by something will be better for me. And that was important. Now I see it as something that's more than just a tool. It, it can be uh, uh, freeing. It's not for me, not like that. I believe that no one is right. And yet there are good things in all types of different philosophies and ideologies. So I like reading about philosophers. I like reading about Buddhism and Hinduism. I love reading about the Quran. But there are things that wouldn't be for me if I was a Muslim because I grew up here and I'm decidedly a feminist. I don't know if that's going to work for me. But I can see how the feminine is in there and how it's beautiful. Um, I try to just be a life learner and go through it and try to whatever sticks, sticks because part of you need it and you're attracting it, but also to to regard it as something that I don't need to carry with me, that I can take the best version of it or at least what I need and, and go through it and, and keep moving. Yeah, I'm more spiritual than religious simply because of what you just said. It's like the slave master was giving us uh, you know, he was making us sick, but then giving us the cure at the same time. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Yeah, and the cure will kill you. Yeah. You know, and uh, that's that, and they knew that. I mean, here's the thing about being a human being. If you can catch our hearts and minds, you got us for life. Mm. You really do. And I think whoever fed you religion is how you take it in. So if they fed it to you and they were corrupt, then you don't take it in as being pure. And my, my, unfortunately, my father was, had, had a, was a corrupt vessel. So in a way, I'd go behind the curtain and he'd be talking all this stuff and he'd be bragging about what he did and look how the white folks are, you know, and how good he was. 
and the other preachers and they spent up money and I was like, that's corrupt. Mm. So to me, religion came to me twofold. Right. So I see it as that. And in fact, a person who can speak well is the person I'm least likely to think is, you know, has, they're good at heart. I look at people's actions. Over time, people make mistakes, but you give them a, a chance to redeem themselves or to live a little and grow, and you see them wanting to change and adapt, that to me is a person that I can follow or listen to or learn something from. And anybody has that, but I'm telling you, a lot of that is a smoke screen for a lot of deep corruption. And people say, why, you know, do you go to church? I said, not often, because all the sinners are there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I try to stay away from all that, you know. But you said you used to obsess over buying your mom a house, too? Hmm? You used to obsess over buying your mom a house? I obsessed over it. Um, I, I just wanted a version of home. I mean, you, we just lived so hand to mouth all the time. And, you know, after a while, you know, to talk about the kindness of strangers is nice. But after a while, you want something. We lived in that so-called, it was a, a shack off of the hotel. And it was roach infested. And she put a chandelier in, and red curtains, red velvet curtains with golden tassels and a piano because she had been raised, although her mother was very abusive, she was, she was the only child, so she'd been raised by the woman in her, car, in her town in Carlsbad who had the most money. And she was being raised to be like Marian Anderson and, oh, you know, speak a certain way. Uh, but she was poor, but she tried to put culture around us. Mm-hmm. Right. And I thought, one day I'm gonna have a place for my mother to put that piano and take those dolls that she bought for us and put them out. And uh, so when I got a little money, that's the first, one of the first things I did. And, Often you can't hold on to it, you know. Sometimes they don't even want it. Yeah. I thought it would bring us all together. We were so dysfunctional at an emotional level. We were so exhausted with being move, moving around. I went to nine different schools by the time I settled into Girls High, Philadelphia High School for Girls. And then uh, that's probably the longest education, that, you know, sort of stable education I had since I was in sixth grade. I just wanted some place to be. Right. And, uh, you know, I got a chance to do it. Greenville, South Carolina is where she went after my father passed, and she had a good time there, but then things changed. Well, did the location, because all of y'all were so spread out, because you wanted everybody together, so Greenville was like, and really out of, out, out of the way from everything it, Well, she were. picked the location. After that, she was um, living in Brooklyn, and I think she was just angry, and she couldn't take all the people. Again, you're talking about people who are from smaller places, mm-hmm. and you kind of need to just go someplace where you can chill, and it's not just coming at you all the time. You know, you don't go out and your car's not scratched or somebody put a ticket yeah. on it. You can't even find a parking spot. You can't find a parking spot. Or, <laughs> or people don't say hello when they pass you. And so she picked Greenville, South Carolina, and, and their people were nice there. But um, um, the family just didn't come together just because there was a house. Mm-hmm. We were still uh, ridiculously um, remote. Gotcha. What do you think about all these reboots they're doing, just to shift gears for a second, of television shows? Uh, are you into it? Are you thinking, okay, I'd love to see Martin or The Fresh Prince or Living Single or anything like that, <laughs> reboots? Well, I don't know, Angela. Listen, here's a, what I think. I think it's great. People are nostalgic uh, for, you know, things in the past, maybe for a good reason. It happens. Um, but for me, I always try to be honest and said, if my film and television career had been a lot better, I might not have any problem dipping my toe back into that water and going and doing Max, the Max character. Um, but for me, I, I, life is so, time is so finite. You have so little time. I, I, I think I just want to see if I can do other things. Right. And see, you know, if I can get people as happy for me or, you know, into a different character or in a different way. So, I mean, that's my goal now. Mm-hmm. Never say never. I, I enjoyed them and this wouldn't be because I didn't have a good time. Just a matter of, you know, I, I, just, I just know that uh, maybe because my, I, I do come from orphans and my father did pass, that you don't get tomorrow. Right. Today wow. is it. Why Why didn't you, you have a broader career, a bigger career? Cause, I mean, you did six seasons of a hit show and you was on Cosby show. Like, yeah. what, what What was the problem? Well, it's part of what we were saying earlier. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that there's a, and, you know, a, a structural bias in people's minds. I also think that being a so-called comedic actress, at least in their minds, I come from drama and I was a dramatic actress, but I was known for being funny. I came in a package that didn't, they didn't think was funny. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm not being, you know, uh, mean when I say they expected black women who were funny to be fatter, to be louder, to be more. <laughs> that was not that, you know. You know, I could play that. Yeah. But, you know, it wasn't where I was coming from. So I don't think I fit the bill, number one. I also think that comedy was ruled by black men. You know, they, mm-hmm. they knew how to make a show for a Wayne's brother or any one of them. They didn't necessarily think that it was valuable or I had any intrinsic value. So you talk about uh, value um, over time. 
and you might have put a lot of in, but doesn't mean that they think it's valuable. If they looked at the show and how much it it earned, and if they looked at the audience on my Q score, they might have said, "Oh no, she'll do well, and people will, you know, it's it'll, it's good to invest in her." But um, if if they don't invest in you, and even though you could have proof and um, all sorts of positive, you know, sort of things around you saying otherwise, they won't, and you'll go away. Damn. Is it true that the character of Maxine Shaw wasn't supposed to be a regular? No, I was supposed to come in every now mm-hmm. and then. She was, and that's why you, she all they saw her. The good news is that she was the only one who could afford her own apartment, which I really liked. <laughs> really you nice know, place. She was really nice, exactly. <laughs> but she ate other people's food, so that helped offset the cost. <laughs> but uh, no, I was supposed to come in every now and then, and it turned out that they saw in the pilot that the audience really liked the ensemble, and. Um, I didn't know that, you know, and it wouldn't have mattered to me. I, I'm used to being an ensemble player, so if I'd come in every now and then, then that would have been the gig. But uh, it just worked out that it, they knew what they had. They wrote toward that. Because the show was built around uh, Kim and Latifah, right? Exactly. Yeah. Latifah and Kim had a deal. I think they even had the same agent. They had the same agent, I think, as Yvette Lee Bowser, who created the show. And I think they put it together as a package. Um, I don't know if Kim Fields did, but I was like... T- TC and I were the last two people they added. We were born on the same day. We met in a hotel. Um, mm-hmm. We had auditioned for it. And I guess one day or two days after y'all, no, one, a day after they cast us, there we were doing the table reading and we were up on our feet. Now, was it ever a real love thing between you and TZ? No. Like you said, y'all had the same birthday. Yeah. And y'all look alike. Like, you know how you said you've been with somebody for so long? It's y'all... true, it's the lock. Yeah. Yeah. No, not at all. Because kissing him would be like kissing my. My brother was kind of nasty. <laughs> and, you know, no, not at all. I mean, we, we liked having the banter. You wait your whole life to find people that you can, you know, you have chemistry with. You mm-hmm. have chemistry here. That's something you can't buy. That has to do with how the balance is and how you guys flow off of each other. But you can try to put it together. You can try to make it. And you can even have the skill sets. But it is like catching lightning in a bottle. And uh, when it's there, when I guess Fred Astaire finds Ginger Rogers and they can dance, you're happy. I didn't know it was going to be there. First, if you look at the first season, they wrote Max to banter back and forth with Regine a lot. Mm-hmm. But what would happen, they would they would double up on Maxine, and Kyle would start to answer. And the audience, again, that's our fourth character, would tell us they would crack up, and then they started sort of pushing it. We still had an acrimonious relationship, me and mm-hmm. Regine, but the, the thing that came to the fore was the fact that Kyle and uh, Max were made for each other. And it just happened to be. But again... That's the luck. What are you most passionate about now? Like producing, writing, or acting? If you have to say, this is where I want to be. This is my most important feeling. Well, I created a company called Color Farm Media. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons I created it it was because of the lack of opportunities for black women and brown women, but also for black people overall, and certainly for differently abled people, elderly. We don't see those people at all. It's like they don't even exist. So I did that in hopes that I could change things, but I started when I was just out of the Cosby Show learning how to write. It took this long to create the discipline, to learn how to do it, to read enough books, to see that there is a structure within a structure, and yet you can't see that. So I'm really passionate about doing it. It's just that when I was doing it before, nobody wanted to hear you. They would take the meeting or they would have the meeting, but they would just sort of pat you on the head and say, oh, great, you know, and, you know, sort of check off, check you off that they met you. There was no um, platform, really, that wanted to take a chance on the things that I was trying to pitch because I was trying to pitch black and brown people as leads. That's changed. It has. The wheel turns. And I tell everybody out there, if they're doing things, if they're creating things, sometimes you have to wait for your moment. It's like real estate. It can hold its value. But finish it. Don't set up there and have it be half done and because its time will come. And that's what happened. Its time came. Suddenly, Ava DuVernay, you had Sandra Rhimes, you had John Ridley, Steve McQueen. You have all these people that I'm talking about in basements from Sean Martinborough. Um, to, you know, Afua Richardson, Nettie Akorfor, who's doing something with George R.R. R. Martin now on HBO. Wonderful, amazing, talented artist. And now their time has come because we have Wakanda and we have people wanting to pay attention to different voices and different superheroes and different ways of viewing the world as who is heroic. What does that look like? Um, but I had to wait for that to happen too. But in the meantime, I had a stack of stuff. So I did, by the way, I have a, um, mm-hmm. a, um, uh, 
horror thriller that set up at Lionsgate mm-hmm. that I wrote. Oh, really? Oh, yes. Horror's my favorite type of movie. Oh, well, Dollface is coming because the genre, because of Get Out. Get Out. That's, that's, my that's the last time a lot of people saw you probably on something. Yeah, they, and, and it was the last time I saw <laughs> myself, too. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I did Queen Sugar, a book, actually. Queen uh, Sugar, yeah, yeah, yeah. For me there, too. And I do Beyond, which is on the uh, free form. But um, I also have a uh, we have a movie that I wrote about the Boys Choir of Harlem. Mm-hmm. It's getting made with Ava DuVernay's producing partners, Tammy and Paul Garns in Electric City. That's Jamie Petrakov's company. And I have Giles, and that's in the bank. But, you know, there's a lot of things that are, luckily for me, that I did finish that are now, you know, valuable. And people are seeking you. They're coming after you They're looking you for me, mm-hmm. and we're looking for them at Color Farm Media. So if you hear about us, we are looking for you. I want to do, like, what Def Jam and Motown did or at their time. There was no way, if you think about it, we would have missed out on Stevie Wonder, Diana Ross, and all these amazing people, but they created a bridge. Right. Mm. Suddenly there was somebody looking for them. And they and can you imagine a world without all those people? No, neither can white people. And you think yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But they're missing out on it because the moving industry is the last place that they segregated, or forget segregated, totally wiped out. And if they can control the dreamscape of us, then they can shoot us down like dogs. That's talk about time's up. That's done. You won't be able to shoot our men down like dogs. You won't be able to, to, to be scared and say, I was afraid. Enough. We're going to show you who we are. And you should be afraid of your own thoughts. It's, everything you're saying is so interesting. I'm so intrigued. But it's, it's like, uh, you know, we've waited so long. But I think that it'll be hard to take this moment from us in Hollywood now because it's people in positions of power behind the camera as yes. opposed to being in front of the camera. You're right. But they could still do it. The thing about it is, is they can't do it mostly because of the Internet. Mm. The world has changed. There are no borders. Right. It's a global economy that's driving this now. And that you can see with the uh, Black Panther, when you think about that, they didn't even release it into China and or Russia. And it still got to a billion dollars. And now it's getting, you know, the, that too. But you're right. I mean, not just behind. For years, there were people behind, but they had no power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the point if they have no power? They have diversity offices and you go and meet the diversity <laughs> person who has no say. That's ridiculous. The power came from the guy who was at Marvel, who was black, who kept pushing it for years and years and years. And then finally they said, okay, let's do it. There's Ryan Coogler. He's ready. Why he's set up from Frankville, Fruitville Station and Creed. He had to be Ryan Coogler first. And then we had Chadwick Boseman doing all those roles, all those iconic roles to step into this iconic space as Black Panther. And then you had something. But all that stuff had to be in place. And unfortunately, there were plenty of people in the backstage who either had no power or also just set on their power, mm. didn't do much, didn't want to put themselves out there. Why? Because what would they want to risk? What? It might fail. Yeah, it might fail, but at least you tried. Right. And they weren't even willing to do that. Does this feel like a uh, a new black renaissance? Because you was in the original black renaissance that people talk about. Whenever they refer <clears throat> to the original black renaissance, they go back to that era. Does this feel like a new one? Mm. Yes, but to me it's a market correction. <laughs> mm, like the makeup Oscar? Yeah. Okay. I see you were always here. Right. You were always talented. You always had your ideas. And to me, it, it's, it's to, I guess I'm. I, it's a, a revival, renaissance, I guess is a correct way to do it. So I agree. But I'm like, it, just when you opened, when you opened and you said, we were doing so well, mm-hmm. and then they stopped. We are always there. So you can't have a revival of something that's, or a renaissance of something that's always there. There's people are always creating. It's now you're paying attention to it. Now you want to make money from it. Because it's now, lucrative and it's a business thing. And I can't deny the fact that this is what's going to make us some money. Exactly. And if there's all these podcasts and radio stations, all that, and not everybody's going to be as big as popular as you, meaning be able to look and all the eyes be in your space, then you're fighting for niche audiences. Mm-hmm. And that's when they want you. Right. It's fine when Fox wants a black audience to help build their brand, their network. But it's different when they abandon that mm. and then go a whole nother way when they think they've made it, when they've got, you know, um, uh, you know, the World Series and all these other things happening for them and, and Ally McBeal, you can't abandon that. But now, go ahead. Your, you know, your sloppy seconds is somebody's, you know, right. ticket to, you know, We come have up. so many options as far as where we can view things and how things can be brought to Hulu, Netflix, the movies, TV. There's just a million, YouTube, everybody has different outlets so we can get things done and you're going to miss out. We're going to miss out. And mm-hmm. streaming is, and for the future has always been, for, by the way, black people are the most powerful yeah. culture makers in the world. Without question. 13% we- African Americans rule the world in terms of how we think about ourselves. We control the cool. We con- <laughs> mm-hmm. we control the cool. Mm-hmm. And you know what? The, controlling the cool 
also is um, uh, probably the best place we could be when you think about slavery and what it brought us and the pain. And then we think about how now everyone perceives themselves through how we, uh, how we uh, sort of, uh, I guess, move forward. We always have to check ourselves and make sure that we're moving forward powerfully. So, you know what I mean? I mean, because we really do uh, move the world. We make this we make this whole thing twirl. So I'm really I'm really proud of us and and I say African Americans. I'm proud of of Latino Americans who are now there's a rebrowning of America. They're coming back. It's not that they ever went anywhere, but uh, we're starting to now not assert our power, but to know our power. How did, how did you feel about Friends ripping off Living Single back in the day? <laughs> and was it true that Living Single was supposed to be named Friends? Yes. Really? Well, they came, well, we were called My Girl when we first, My Girls, when we first uh, did our pilot. And the, uh, it didn't test well, you know how they test things. So they came down, and we were now filming the actual series. And one of the executives had a whole list of names, three or four or five of them. And he read them out and it was Living Single, Friends, blah, 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 blah. And they chose Living Single for us, and then the next year they created Friends. Oh, the same people that had the same people names. were Warner Brothers. They're both right. Warner Brothers. God we were on the damn. ranch lot, and they were on the big lot. We called the ranch the ghetto lot because <laughs> <laughs> we, didn't, we had nothing on that lot. We actually had no air conditioning or or heat. Oh we my gosh. Walk, we had a walkout because crazy. we had no. Our craft service table was basically rice with Tabasco sauce and Ritz crackers. You know, and you know, just I just come from Cosby Show. I didn't expect them to have a spread like that. That's what you get when you're number one in your market and all that. But I did expect us to have some kind of, you know, protein. Yeah, can rice. we have can we have a piece of ham or something? <laughs> so no, that's that's so that's what's happened with friends. Uh, yeah, and you know, and at the end of our run, we were pay, being paid a lot less, and people would say, "Well, you had a smaller market share." I said, "Compared to what? You know, comparatively, yes, but you know." If you think about how much they made paying us so little and how much they made in syndication all around the world all these years. Mm -hmm. right? uh, get the goddamn we, goofy dust. Could do, what is thank it? you. Go get it. Yeah, get the goof <laughs> dust. Get the goof dust. He because, said goofy. Yeah, because they $2.5 million Sheesh. to our $55,000 at our, our, like our nadir. The whole cast? No, per, per, per episode. Person. Okay, okay. That sounds like a lot of money, and it is then, but, you know, if you... 2.5 million per episode for them. Oh, production 50, budget. For, no, no, for our, you know, like my salary. Okay, $55,000 gotcha, $55, per week. Okay, 26 shows. But if you were friends, $2.5 million per week. Per week? That's per crazy. Per person. Well, did it have anything to do with the network? What they, what they on like, NBC? Or? It, they were on NBC and we yeah. were on Fox. It does. I mean, you know, Fox had to, wasn't considered a network then. It got a lot of breaks to become a network. But also what happened is that you're, Again, you're seeing the fact that we didn't get the marketing, we didn't get the play. There were a lot of things that are in place to keep to hold down and, and and make you not feel as valuable. But if you, but I'm sure if they looked and scaled and you know looked at it and how much they made versus what they put in, I'm sure we're on par, if not way beyond what they made. Right. I can't name one person off friends. I'm fully aware it was a huge <laughs> no, show. This, <laughs> Just character. Jennifer Aniston. No, Jennifer, oh, she was on Friends. Oh, I don't she, know. She, she was. Yeah. She was okay. on Friends. Mm -hmm. Was it um, Joey Lawrence on there? Maybe. Never mind. Joey Lawrence. I don't know. All white people look like to me. Funny. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> now, what's your relationship with like uh, the, the women from Living Single now? We're all friends. Um, obviously, Latif is all over the place, and you know I don't get to see her as much or say hello. Um, that probably would all have been, always been the case because she was a rapper and totally moved in different circles. Kim Fields is a, a mother mm -hmm. of two, and she's down in Atlanta. She's also a director. She follows me on Instagram. I hit her up and said, oh, come on the show. Oh, yes, a long time, maybe a, maybe a month ago. Did she respond? Oh, no. She did actually. Okay, but that's nice. I don't know if she did or not, but she always like. Please, I'm sure post she would on love my page. To. I'd I'm love sure to have her up here. Oh, because yeah, she oh. got a book out. I think. Yeah, she does. She yeah. does. She has a book out. Yeah, she's you know that's a that's a showbiz baby. That's she was born into this. Her mother's from Harlem. She was born in Harlem, actually, Kim. Um, TC is in Atlanta. He's been doing his jazz, and he comes from musical theater. We all came from different places. We always we were all doing some kind of live theater. Even mm -hmm. Latifa, if you think about her singing and her excuse me her rapping and performance. John Hinton is a comedian, and he's from Cleveland, Ohio. He has a child, so you see him um, on the road a lot. He spends his time between Cleveland and Los Angeles. And then Kim Coles, we did the BFF Chronicles. We mm -hmm. did that together, and that was just uh, being foolish and having fun. And we talk more often than anybody. She's a great friend. Yeah, I just feel like uh, Queen Latifah was somebody who seemed like she could have bridged that gap for y'all back then. Yeah. She, she had the Flavor Unit Productions thing going. Yeah. 
she might have. I mean, you know, I try not to hold her hostage just because you're a friend. You're supposed to do things. But I think that that would have been possible. You never slipped a script like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> I have. I have gave her the, 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 she got the first crack at the Boys Choir of Harlem. Mm -hmm. You know, but uh, it's where it is now. Where? All right. Oh, well, Miss Erica Alexander, this has been a pleasure. You it's hear my me? Pleasure. Thank Fire you so Media much. You production way. company. We are looking for people. <laughs> yeah, we are looking for you. And thank you so much for all that you do because you have to know I watch all your shows. Thank you. I mean, everything thank you for having is no online. Taste. No, 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 no. I learned so much. <laughs> and I really am fascinated about how you get to be young uh, people of color here and talk to people about things, current events, and also be kind of, you know, uh, digging and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. It's really uh, a sharp you know, to be sharp and you have to be on it all the time. And um, I'm not yeah, impressed. Early. I think I'm, it's, oh, it's a beautiful thing. It's not, right. not something that ever happened while I was growing up, you know. Oh, well, so that means cool. a lot. And hopefully that means a lot. Congratulations you. on your book and Thank you. all the things that are happening with you and congratulations on everything. Yeah, hopefully yeah. that means a lot to kids who watch too and they can say, oh, I see a lot of people always hit us up like, oh, I want to do something like The Breakfast Club or I want to do radio. You guys inspire me. Representation It is matters. a big deal, representation. It does. No, it, it more than matters. It's, it's changing people's lives. Thank you. All right, thank you. I can't wait to see uh, what you do next. I know you got some fire scripts you sitting on. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm doing the best I can. I better take my vitamins. <laughs> I'm glad I was here. It's Erica Alexander, y'all, The Breakfast Club. <laughs>